So those of you who have not seen Carnot maps before, uh, you can find it in some textbooks or on the web. There are a number of web pages, including there is some. We have something on our website, so you can go there and take a look. And uh, now here is an example. Okay, I guess it's time for us to uh, go to the pool. So. Okay, let's uh, switch to the board. Now here's an example. A uh, combinational circuit. And let us assume that we have uh, three inputs and one output, and the inputs are x1, x2, and x3. And our output is perhaps called f. And here are all the combinations. And let us assume that our function f is specified in this way. So here is the truth table. And we want to implement this. seconds. Um, okay, now let us uh, try to uh, uh, minimize it using a Carnot map. Uh, and here is the same information. Recently I looked up about who invented uh, Carnot maps and it turns out that uh, uh, the Carnot maps were invented by a Mr. Carnot, who used to work with AT&T Bell Labs. AT&T Bell Labs, they used to uh, manufacture uh, computing devices, Mo mostly uh, uh, telephone uh, switches, networks. And he came up with this clever idea that if he can uh, arrange this type of information in a graphical form, then uh, he can uh, figure out which terms can be combined using Boolean algebra in a convenient way. So in the scheme that he came up with, so here we have, this is uh, complement of x1 and this is x1. So we could say this is x1. And here we have This half is x2 and other half is the complement of x2. And here is x3. So this inner part is x3 and outer half is complement of x3. And uh, so let's. Uh, and here, this is a cell uh, 0, 0, 0, this is 0, 0, 1. This incidentally, this here is 0, 1, 0. So let's put the values of f in. So we have 0, 0, 0 is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 0 is 0, 0, 1, 1. So the output is supposed to be 1 when x1, x2, x3 are 0, 1, 1. Similarly, we have 1, 0, 1, 0. 
Or did I make a mistake here somewhere? See, oh, I guess I wanted to make this a one. Uh, let's make that a one. So it confirms with uh, what I have here in my notes. Otherwise, it will be a less interesting example. So I'll just make that a one. So here we have uh, uh, the truth table, and here's the karma map. And we can uh, come up with an implementation of this. So we can uh, combine this term and this term. We can combine these two terms. And we can combine these two terms. Now since we have a few uh, ECE students here, so some of you will object to one of the combinations, probably. But uh, let us see what happens. Now, as you know, this combination is not necessary because once all the ones are covered, then uh, that is enough. And if your object is minimization, then of course you want to come up with a simple expression. So f is equal to uh, let's take this term here, and that term is uh, x1 bar x2. And these two here are x1 x3 bar. Now let us assume, now what would happen if I would uh, include this also? And this happens to be x2, x3 bar. So which of these uh, two solutions do you like? And of course our objective is to uh, do a minimization. So obviously this is the desired uh, answer. And here notice that this term is redundant. It wasn't needed. But if you will uh, build this circuit uh, using the second uh, form of the formula, it will still work correctly. And of course, uh, if you have been, uh, how many of you have been involved in designing asynchronous circuits? So if you have, it, it's, it's not very popular designing asynchronous circuits, except for some special purposes. But if you are doing asynchronous design, then sometimes uh, such terms they need to be included. But most of the time, all your designs are synchronous sequential circuits, and you will exclude this term. But if you would include that, that will be redundant term. That means it is not going to hurt you. Well, uh, let me see. Can I say that? Uh, functionally, it's not going to uh, give you a problem. Your will still work correctly, except that this is redundant. And when you will uh, implement your circuit, it is going to uh, look like this. So here, you have, this is, this is basically what you call a two-level design. So here you have an for gate. And so if you implement this, you have here, x1 bar, and here you have x2, and here you have the x1, x3 bar, and here is f. So here is your, um, now incidentally, uh, if you assume that these uh, x1, x2, x3 are coming from some flip-flops, then the complemented versions are uh, also available. So you don't have to use extra inverters. But in case they are not, you may have to use inverters. So if you want, you can put some inverters in there to generate uh, x1 bar and x3 bar. But uh, I will uh, skip those inverters. Now if you will consider 
A second subject, I guess I need some colored chalk there. Maybe instead of colored chalk, I will use a dotted line. So consider this possibility. Ah, two, two lines there. So what will happen if I have uh, this also in the subject? Now let's assume that uh, I have this subject and obviously it will work correctly. Now what will happen if this line has a fault and it has a uh, stuck at zero fault? Now later on I will talk about fault modeling and I will mention that a lot of times many faults they basically work as if a certain line was always stuck at the value 0 or at value 1. Now what will happen if this is stuck at 0? Now you can see that this uh, is still x1 bar x2 and this here is still x1 x3 bar, so your f is still correct. So even when the fault is there, the behavior of the circuit is still correct. That means this fault is not testable, right? Now, if, now usually we will assume that you can access the inputs. So here are the inputs. You can apply some inputs and you observe the outputs and by looking at inputs and outputs you have to decide whether a fault is there or not. And if a fault does not affect the behavior of the circuit under any circumstances, then that fault is basically not testable. So this is an example of a fault which is an untestable fault. Um, and as you can see that untestable fault is related with this redundant term. So if you have a redundancy in your uh, logic, then uh, you may have some faults which are untestable. Uh, how common are untestable faults? Um, it turns out that untestable faults in uh, circuit design, they can cause a lot of problems. Um, usually people will do some optimization, but optimization is never uh, uh, completely, uh, optimization is never uh, uh, total. So there would always be a few redundancies left behind in the circuit. And that means that in a, a large circuit, you will have a few faults which would be untestable. And later on we will talk about uh, test generation algorithms. So these test generation algorithms, they basically search this input space to <coughs> attempt to find a test for the fault. And if something is an untestable fault, your programs keep on working and working and working until it gets tired. So usually uh, people who write those programs, they uh, put a limit that after a certain amount of time, a fault, if a test for a fault has not been found, it will be declared to be untestable. So they can cause some problems in uh, uh, test generation. Uh, which we will talk about later. So next time uh, we are going to look at uh, redundancies and circuits and uh, continue this and we are going to look at uh, sequential circuits and uh, uh, take a look at uh, finite state machines and this will be sort of our review uh, before we uh, uh, formally start talking about uh, testing. So that's it for today and we will continue uh, next time.